what we've talked about, uh, KVP, we'll just go one at a time, uh, KVP, any questions on KVP, what changes does KVP affect, what they don't affect, be it in the, the brim spectrum, interactions inside of the patient, or interaction at the image receptor. Um, any questions on MA? What, uh, where we have MA, what MA controls? Well, let's back, back up to KVP. Uh, what KVP controls inside the x-ray tube or inside the x-ray beam? No? Okay. Um, then MA um, inside the x-ray tube? Because we don't have mass until exposure, right? So we don't have mass until we actually depress the exposure button we're creating x-rays. And time or reciprocity, any of that. Um, SID, changes in SID, what that does to, at this point, just intensity. Um, doesn't really affect KVP, you know, doesn't affect anything except for numbers. And I think it bears a little bit of repeating, uh, or a, a little bit of, not really repeating, but a, a little bit of explanation in how um, mass, or I'm sorry, distance uh, uh, affects the intensity. So I'm gonna kill that screen, okay. So um, how it, it affects the, the intensity or the number of photons um, comes with a little bit of an assumption, right? So if my image receptor size, let's see, I can kind of get a square off of this. If my image receptor size was as big as that light field, then 100% of the light is hitting the image receptor, right? But if I pass this all the way back to the room, uh, back to the back of the room, okay? <laughs> so what happened to my light field? Expanded. What's that? Expanded. Expanded, it's bigger, right? So if my image receptor size remained the same, then uh, do I need all that? You know, if this was x-ray beam instead of light, beam of light, when I need all of that x-ray beam? No. The answer is no, I would not, right? So what would I need to do to make sure that I didn't overexpose the patient? The exposed patient to radiation didn't need to be exposed. Common. Common, right. So uh, when we talk about increases in, in SID and the decreases in intensity, the, there's nothing magical in the increase in, in SID that reduces intensity, you can pass it back up. Um, there's nothing magical in the increase in SID that's going to change the intensity. What changes is where the, the beam goes, right? And what we have to do with the beam and eliminate a portion of that beam. So what we're using is just the, the middle of the beam and eliminate the rest of it <coughs> so that we have um, less intensity, right? So that's the inverse square law, you increase the distance, you lose intensity. The direct square law is the one where we reintroduce those photons and we change our technique. So again, on your, your tests, what you need to be looking for is mass. If it's asking for mass, then it's asking for what? Which law do you use to get to the proper mass? Inverse square law, direct square law? Direct square law. So inverse square law is always going to be the MR, um, those things. Uh, radiation dose or exposure to the patient or exposure to you. <clears throat> All right, so radiographic technique is uh, now what we're going to get into is, is the patient factor. So we're going to talk about uh, thickness versus body composition. So they're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, they can be the same thing to a degree, but um, uh, you know, you can change body composition and thickness all at the same time, but you can have uh, difference in, in both of those. So we're going to talk about uh, image quality factors, image receptor exposure in context of what happens as we change patient thickness um, and body composition, how that's going to give us a, an appearance on detail and distortion, um, and then also we're going to throw back in KVP, MA, exposure time, SID, and throughout the semester we're going to talk about grids, screens, uh, focal spot size even more in filtration. So we have four basic body habiti. We've got um, sthenic, which, uh, you know, it says muscular. Um, it's large average, right? Um, and then we've got hyposthenic, which 
it kind of has Brunner's build, so it's a, a thinner average. And then the other two are, are the extremes. We've got hypersthenic and we have asthenic. So uh, each, each one of those are gonna carry a lot of different potential um, imaging complications with them. Um, not really complications, but things that we have to consider. Like uh, not just the, the technique, but we've talked about patient body habitus in positioning as well. Uh, we just came through GI um, and there are implications for centering with different body habitus as well, right? So uh, it carries with it the, the, the different body habitus of the, the body habitus of the patient that you're uh, imaging comes with it uh, implications for not just imaging, not just positioning, but both, all right? So generally speaking at this point, what we're gonna adjust for with different body habitus um, is going to be, if the only thing we're looking at is difference in body habitus, then um, what we're gonna be using as a, a compensation for that is going to be mass at this point. Again, I, I expect that will probably change to a degree. And in fact, it already has. And I may have walked through this with y'all already. Um, I think I have. Sometimes the, the uh, lectures between freshmen and sophomores kind of bleed over. Same information we're going to cover in your sophomore year. Um, but uh, when we changed from screens and films, we, we changed our KVP. All right. So what I mean by that is that uh, without getting into all the details of it, since um, KVP affected our contrast as the main thing that we have, we use to affect the change in contrast on film. Then we used uh, KVP. Uh, we uh, we used a relatively set KVP. All right. We didn't adjust our KVP. We used uh, a high enough KVP to get adequate penetration, but not any more than that. And then we fluctuated our mass. Because if we increased our KVP, we would lose contrast. You increase the KVP on screens and films, and contrast would go down. You got more penetration through different types of tissues. That's what we call differential absorption, uh, a word you need to follow away. Differential absorption just means uh, absorption characteristics differ in different types of tissue, right? So as we increase KVP, we penetrated through uh, more tissue types, differential absorption went down, and we lost contrast. This is mainly context, but you're going to hear differential absorption, uh, you know, over and over over the next five semesters. So, uh, with that that decrease, uh, that in decrease in differential absorption, we lost contrast. Uh, but when we went to digital processing, that wasn't an issue anymore because the computer algorithm is mainly what controls our contrast. So, uh, techniques we started using techniques with higher KVP. Um, and then when, when we went to DR, it became even more dependent on that computer algorithm. I won't say KVP doesn't matter anymore, um, because it very much does, but the, the, how high KVP you use matters less than it ever has before. So for an abdomen, you could shoot a, a KUB with 100 KVP, and the computer algorithm is going to make it look almost identical to something that, that you shot with 75 KVP. All right, so what are the imaging implications for that? Really none, but what are the patient dose implications? Well, if you increase your KVP and you reduce your mass, what happens to patient dose? It goes down, it goes down, right? So uh, as a result, we use, now use higher KVP, lower mass, and I expect that, I could be completely wrong, but I kind of expect that to continue, um, and uh, I, I expect to see at least one more wave of increase in KVP and decreases in mass to save patient dose. So, uh, with uh, but right now the industry standard still hangs onto that mass um, to a degree onto that mass uh, correction in technique. And the reason I say to a degree is because if you go to clinicals and you look at, at your automatic programs, you can select the patient body habits, right? So you look at the, you know, you push chest x-ray and you should have in your presets, you should have an opportunity to select like pediatric, which would be kind of analogous to asthenic um, versus maybe two adult size 
potential techniques. And what you'll see is as you push those, KVP will adjust, okay? So um, what we use now is kind of a, a little bit of a, a hybrid. Um, your exposure technique or your, your automatic exposure control is gonna set your mass. And if you have a hypersthetic patient, then what you're gonna have is a, a, a increase in mass. But if you select that hypersthetic patient, body habitus on your technique, it's also gonna give you a higher KVP, okay? So how do you answer the question? Well, as you change from asthenic to sthenic, what's gonna happen is with that, that change in thickness, uh, the patient's gonna absorb more photons, all right? So more photons, what, contra what controls the number of photons? Mass. Mass. So the patient's gonna absorb more photons. You have fewer photons to the image receptor, so you need to adjust. Mass, mass, right. So that's the standard now. Uh, standard answer to that question is that if, you know, if, if you have a patient, uh, you know, with increased thickness, then what you need to increase is mass. Okay, so that's kind of the preface to it, but we've also got uh, things to consider like uh, fat versus muscle versus bone versus lung, absorption characteristics of each one of those. And it's not going to be the absorption characteristics um, we've got two things to consider. One is tissue density and atomic number. Okay, so you gotta consider both of those things. What we have a tendency to do is fixate just on atomic number, but it's much deeper than that. Um, we have to uh, consider the, the tissue density as well. Okay, so, and then we'll talk also about the pathology and the different types of pathology. Fundamentally, we have two from a radiographic standpoint. We have pathologies that add tissue density, and we're gonna call those additive. And you've got tissue pathologies that uh, reduce tissue density, and we're gonna call those subtractive. So additive or constructive, uh, subtractive or uh, destructive tissue um, pathologies. All right, so patient density. When we're talking about patient density, what we're talking about uh, fundamentally is the, the thickness, the uh, radial opacity of the tissue type, right? So not to be confused strictly with, with atomic number, that's gonna be something different that we're gonna take a look at here in a minute, but density is uh, just a, the definition out of, the, out of Webster's is having high opacity. So um, on the patient density, what we're, we're talking about in patient density is the thickness or the hardness of the tissue type. Uh, muscle versus soft uh, other soft tissue, fat. Uh, adipose tissue um, and muscle are very similar. They're both water-based, but muscle tissue is a little bit more dense than what is um, adipose tissue. So both water-based, both have a lot of fluid in them, but consider what you've got in, in your muscles. Um, as, as opposed to adipose tissue. You cut into a, a raw steak, and what do you see? What does it look like? Or even a rare steak, what do you see? Purple. Yeah, it's purple, it's red. What do you suppose that red, uh, where that red comes from? Some of you are gonna say blood, and then some other people are gonna say, no, that's my, you know, whatever. Iron, right? So how much iron do you have in your fat? You cut into a nice big fat slab of bacon and a fatty portion, how red is that? Not, right? So water versus iron, you take a big chunk of iron and you put it in the water and what happens to it? It's like a rock, right? Like iron. So um, <clears throat> with the iron, with the, the muscle tissue, what you've got is even though they're very similar, they are different. Right? So the muscle is a little bit harder to penetrate than what is the, the adipose tissue. On the x-ray, what we're talking about in density, so we have two different types of density. We have uh, patient density, but we've also got radiographic density. And the, the radiographic density is how dark the image is. And uh, you can be talking about the, the overall image, uh, 
um, you know, if you process a, a set of ribs with a chest X-ray um, algorithm, it's going to look like a chest X-ray. Regardless of what KVP you used, it's going to look like a chest X-ray, right? So what happens is the, the overall appearance of the image changes so that, um, you know, it might appear more gray, right? And what you're get, getting there is because you processed it under a, a chest X-ray algorithm, it's giving you that gray so that you can kind of see uh, the lungs without the ribs being so bold, right? So uh, when we're talking about the the density, we can be talking about the overall image, but we can also be talking about specific anatomy within the, uh, the image, right? So we can say something is too dense, um, and you may be talking about a, a specific anatomy, maybe the entire image. So uh, generally speaking, unless you use the, the improper computer algorithm, um, you don't really see a, an effect with your technique on the overall uh, appearance of the image unless you do something really, really crazy. Uh, if you greatly overexpose something, um, think of your individual uh, detectors inside your image receptor as being kind of like cups, okay? So how you get difference in density is what we call contrast, is those cups fill up at a different rate. Right, so one cup may completely fill up with X-ray photons, right? And that's gonna give you a very dark image in that area. One doesn't fill up hardly at all, and that's gonna be a light area. Air, boom. You can kind of follow in the analogy? Okay, so then what, ha what would happen in that analogy if you just turned on a water hose and filled all the cups up? Black. Yeah, contrast has to have Contrast means difference, right? So contrast means the difference in density. All right, so you have to have contrast, you have to have density. If you were to make an exposure of a hand and you used 100 mass, okay, you're gonna lose something there. You're not gonna have a good image. Uh, even your computer can't figure out what kind of stupidity you did there, right? 100 mass is a big exposure, especially for a hand, right? So. Um, in that case, you're gonna lose some contrast, but within a, a, a reasonable technique and a range of techniques, your KVP and your mass, your computer can kind of correct for some of that and reduce the, the need to, to go back and uh, re-expose the patient. What is the indication that you've got too much density or exposure though? What do you use to, to determine whether or not you use too much or too little technique? That's right. that's, yeah, that's number, index number. Uh, S number is kind of proprietary. Uh, I think a, a few different manufacturers use the term index number, but some use EI number, exposure index number, um, and it is just that calculation of how much the, the image receptor received and it compares it to how much it should have received and tells you whether you've over or underexposed the patient. So really that's replaced radiographic density. Patient density remains the same as it ever was. Okay, patient density just means how thick, how hard, how radiopaque the image is, is radiographic density, um, the image, but that, that di density, the patient density, the thickness of the tissue is what gives us that. Okay, so patient density still remains a thing, radiographic density still remains a thing, but you don't really control the radiographic density as much as what we used to. So patient density, not the same as thickness. Um, so really with, with patient density, we've, we've got compactness of the tissue. All right, let me see if I can find this real quick. I thought it was in this chapter, it is not. Okay, so um, atomic number all by itself, uh, I don't wanna say it's completely meaningless, but uh, somewhere in the Bouchon, and again, if I had you know, the, the time this morning, I would have, would have found it uh, for reference. But uh, somewhere in Bouchon, it gives you the atomic number of bone, soft tissue, and air. All right? So let's go back to this slide. So you've got basically four different body compositions. You've got fat, muscle, bone, and lung. 
air uh, being the lump. So uh, you're going to have questions. Uh, this test, another test, sometime you're going to have to pick out from uh, the most radio lucent to the most radio opaque. So looking at that list and thinking about your image and and how things appear on your image and what we've talked about in adipose tissue versus muscle, if I were to ask you to, to identify these four, mus uh, four um, tissue types in order of their radio opacity from the lowest to the highest, in other words, what can you penetrate easiest? From the, the most, the easiest to the hardest to penetrate, what would you say? What would be number one? Lung, air, right, right. So you think of air, what do you think of uh, atomic number wise? Low. Very low, right? I mean, it's air, you know? I mean, I'm, it doesn't weigh anything, <laughs> right? So air, and then what would you think? Uh, Fat, and then muscle. muscle, and then bone, right? So you're gonna have those questions over and over, all the way through the registry, just remember that sequence you know, for that particular question. Easiest thing penetrates the lung, followed by adipose, fat tissue, and then muscle, then bone. Would it surprise you, though, if I were to tell you that the atomic number of air is actually higher than soft tissue? Just going to be <laughs> Would it? Not by much, but it is. So what's the difference? Uh, 0.2 or something uh, stupid. I don't remember exactly. You you talking about the the atomic number of air? Oh, you were just talking about. I think the atomic number of air and and uh, soft tissue, just regular soft tissue, is somewhere around seven point something the atomic number. Okay, so what's air made of? What is it? What do you breathe? Oxygen. It's oxygen. Probably a little bit of water in there. It's hydrogen. You know, there's all kinds of different individual particles, but how how uh, how pressed together are they? Not very, not very. So the actual atomic number of air is greater than uh, that of soft tissue, only by a little bit, but it is greater. So what's the difference between the two? And that is the compactness. Okay. So when we're talking about uh, tissue density, that's what we're talking about is not just the atomic number because that all, all by itself can be deceiving, but the atomic number combined with the compactness thereof, all right? All right. So having a high mass per volume or per unit volume, um, compactness, crowding together of the parts, gives us our patient density. So what are the patient factors that control that? Well, one is body habitus, we've talked about that before. Um, but we can also have <coughs> conditions that increase the relative uh, density of the tissue, okay? So hypertrophy and hypotrophy are two things, um, and they kind of illustrate the difference between additive and subtractive, okay? So what is hypertrophy? What is it? Hyper meaning above average, greater than, right? So hypertrophy just means um, overbuilding. And we can get to hypertrophy from a lot of different ways. It's not always bad, you know. There are some pathologic conditions, normal variants, let's say, that lead to hypertrophy. Some people are born with a tiny kidney since we just came through uh, urinary system, some people are born with one tiny kidney, okay? So in order to compensate for that one, the other one is going to be hypertrophic and it's gonna be large, all right? So some people are just born with one kidney, it's a big kidney, all right? So uh, hypertrophy, overbuilding, uh, where you see that hypertrophy um, a lot is, you know, people work out, build muscles. Uh, bodybuilders have these great big muscles. Uh, anybody seen Arnold Schwarzenegger lately? He used to be massive, right? He's a little flabby now, <laughs> happens to all of us. Uh, so he, hypertrophy, um, 
usually is due to a stimulus. You work out, you build a muscle, become a couch potato, and what happens to it? Atrophy. Yep, atrophies. It goes away. So hypotrophy is underdeveloped. All right, so now we're getting into atrophy. And uh, atrophy, hypot hypotrophy is usually also due to a, uh, I won't say due to a stimulus, but due to a lack of stimulus. All right, so you don't work out and it starts to deteriorate. Uh, but it could be not due to a stimulus, but a pathological condition. Osteoporosis being an example. Osteoporosis occurs usually post menopause because um, your bones, uh, while you're still active, your bones uh, break down and rebuild at a constant rate. That's why, uh, you know, again, your bodybuilders, people who exercise a lot, have healthy bones. It's because they're breaking them down and building them back up, breaking them down and building them back, back up, just like the muscles. All right, but uh, after. Um, menopause, what happens is those bones continue to be broken down, but they don't build back up as well. So what we get is hypotrophy. We get uh, atrophy of the bony tissue and it becomes less dense and less compact. So hypertrophy, you've got a patient who's a bodybuilder. What do they add? Soft tissue, but what specific type of soft tissue? is muscle, right? So they become uh, more absorbent. <laughs> I make it sound like cat litter, but they become more absorbent, right? Uh, so they absorb more of the x-ray. So you lose photons to the image receptor, you lose photons to the image receptor, and so what do you need to do? Technique. Increase your technique specifically. Mm -hmm. Mass, right? Numbers equal mass. So you have hypotrophy though, and it becomes a little bit more complicated. Even some of your hypertrophy can become more complicated. So you've got your patient, um, your, your uh, patient with osteoporosis, right? We already established osteoporosis is bone loss. So the bone becomes more thin. So in order to see bone, what kind of interactions inside of the patient do you need? Photoelectric absorption, right? So you need the absorption. What controls your absorption? KVP. KVP. So uh, should you change your KVP if you have a patient with osteoporosis, known osteoporosis? Traditionally on films, yeah, it made a difference. Does it make a difference as much of a difference now as probably? No, it does not. But it does change the imaging characteristics. The bone, the loss of bone does. It changes the imaging characteristics. So would it be necessarily wrong to decrease your KVP if you knew you had a patient with osteoporosis? Again, probably not. Will it make that much of a difference if you change KVP or mass for a third time? Probably not. All right, so uh, most of the time your techn technical factor of choice is going to be at this point, mass. Change of mass, right? So you got to change mass, um, but you still may see some questions all the way through the registry that say that in cases where we've got a marked increase in tissue density, hypertrophy, uh, osteopetrosis, you don't know what that is yet? Pretty much the opposite radiographically of osteoporosis, overdevelopment of bone. And uh, Amy will get into that. Uh, whenever y'all do pathology. Over de development of bone. So you got more, you have too much bone. Could be because a uh, patient's got a pituitary tumor. Leads to, you know, over development of bone. Um, so kind of going back to what we were talking about a second ago, you got over development of bone. Um, the bone's going to absorb more x-rays, right? possibly an unhealthy amount of x-rays, so to speak. So what might you do to mitigate some of the, um, the dose the patient may absorb? Instead of increasing mass, what could you do? Increase KVP. Increase KVP for osteopetrosis. 
decreased KVP for osteoporosis. Okay, so you may see some of those questions all the way through the registry that if you have a market increase in, uh, in tissue density, then you may need to increase your KVP, you know, hypertrophy. And if you have a market decrease in uh, density, in tissue density, you may need to decrease KVP as opposed to changing the mass. All right? But everything else, pretty much everything else, technical factor of choice is always going to be, except for those, those cases, is going to be, at this point, changes the mass. Okay? So that's kind of what we talked about before, composition, bone versus soft tissue versus air. Uh, depends on, on the concentration of the stuff. You know, soft tissue, is it, is it muscle? Is it adipose? Uh, you know, because in air we've got, um, you know, a higher atomic number, but it's so dis dispersed, it, uh, you know, it kind of negates the, the effect of that atomic number. So bone... If we have an increase in bone, we might want to increase KVP, but if we have an increase in soft tissue, we probably want to increase mass. If we have an increase in air, on the other hand, we might need to decrease. Might need to decrease our technique. So here's your critical thinking question of the day. You're doing portable on a patient, all right? <clears throat> so you walk up to the patient's room and you're doing a portable abdomen on this patient and their stomach is distended. It's a great big, I don't want to say fat, it's just a distended stomach, right? The belly is big. How do you determine whether that patient has uh, air in, in their stomach versus soft tissue? What, what can you do? First one is very easy and obvious. Read a chart. Read a chart. Ask somebody, right? Ask the nurse. You know, this patient full of fluid, full of air. We got a bowel obstruction. What do you always have with a bowel obstruction? Always have air with a bowel obstruction. We tend to think of bowel obstruction where they got something mechanically blocking it, but they got air in there. They got a lot of air in there. That's how we diagnose a bowel obstruction radiographically is air fluid levels. They've got air in there. Yeah, they got some fluid too, but they got a lot of air if they've got a bowel obstruction. All right? So, might that affect your, your technique? And the answer is yeah. You know, I mean, you've got a belly out to here and 90% of that is air. Well, how hard is air to penetrate? Not, right? So, if you set a technique for a, a distended abdomen, assuming that it's all fluid, you know, they just got a beer belly, right? And you set the technique based on that, you're gonna overexpose the patient, overexpose the image receptor. But are there telltale indicators when you walk into a patient's room? If you've done portables enough, you might have seen this, but you, you, know, you might not have made the connection yet. Are there telltale indicators a patient might have a bowel obstruction? I don't know. NG2. Bingo. Who said that? Very good. NG tube. Patient's got an NG tube. Uh, is the NG tube hooked up to suction canister? If the NG tube is hooked up, hooked up to a suction canister and there's bile in the suction canister, 99% of the time will, I, I, I would bet big money that the patient has bowel obstruction. Okay. If they don't have an NG tube and they got the great big belly, well, okay, they, there's, there are conditions that cause that. Um, enlarged liver, that could be because the patient has uh, cirrhosis, right? Could be uh, sickle cell, it tends to, to give you that. So uh, there are indicators. Um, if it's, you know, they got an NG tube and it's hooked up to, to suction, Assume that the patient and there's bowel in the canister. Assume that the patient has bowel obstruction. Adjust your technique accordingly. If none of that happens, probably not a bowel obstruction. Um, ascites. What is ascites? What's that? It doesn't cross uh, you're thinking atelectasis. Okay. Is that fluid? Fluid. It's just fluid. Ascites occurs all over the patient's body. Okay, so you walk into the patient, into, into the room, 
and the patient's got a big, you know, they're, they're kind of big. Um, they're telltale indicators also uh, if the patient's full of fluid, okay? So if they're on a, a breathing mask and the mask just seems to be sunk into their face, kind of like a, um, a memory foam mattress, that's a good indication they're full of fluid. Look at their ankles, and if you can see them malleoli, they're not full of fluid. If you can't see it, and you reach over and you kind of gently uh, squeeze, and it doesn't spring back immediately like healthy tissue, then they're fine, they're not full of fluid. But if it stays kind of like, again, a memory foam, and it takes a little bit of time for it to come back, they are full of fluid. So if they're full of fluid, what would you want to, uh, what technical, what would you want to do with your technique? Increase what? KVP or mass? Don't think patient dose, think what is industry standard right now? Mass. Mass. Right. So it changed mass. So you'd increase your mass. Alright? Uh, so to, to increase KVP, select uh, KVP, especially for an increase, you kind of have to know what's going on with the patient. Um, uh, you know, does the patient have, uh, you know, acromegaly? You got telltale indicators the patient has acromegaly. Acromegaly occurs because the patient has a pituitary tumor. Uh, they're your giants. Okay, so if, if you got uh, a patient who developed a, a pituitary tumor before the growth plate healed, sealed up, they're going to be huge. Andre the Giant, anybody know who he is? Mm -hmm. Princess Bride, anybody seen that? Awesome movie. If you've not seen it, uh, I don't know what to tell you. It's one of the best movies ever. Uh, and, and guys, it's, it's not a chick flick. It's, you know, it's an adventure thing. It's a great movie. Anyway, the big guy in that is he's like seven foot one and this big, you know, and he's, he had a pituitary tumor. He giantism. If it occurs afterwards, then what you'll see is the patient, in a lot of cases, uh, the girth of the bones will increase. So the bones get bigger. So you got telltale indicators for some of that, but uh, not always. So in those cases, you might increase mass or KVP. So other pathologies we'll talk about, rules of thumb. Um, <clears throat> general rule of thumb for, for technical uh, adjustment it's going to be, and again, file this away all the way through the registry. It's a 30 to 50 percent increase in mass. Okay, so 30 to 50 percent increase in mass. So you've got an additive condition, soft tissue additive condition. What are you going to do? What's your technique consideration or technique adjustment? 30 to 50 percent increase in mass. Right. So you shot. You would shoot it with 100 kvp, or a, I'm sorry, 100 mass, but you've got this additive condition, you'd use 130 to 150 mass, right? 30 to 50 percent increase in mass or decrease in mass if it's a destructive condition. Uh, let me bring these up and we will end with this. Uh, again, bears some explanation and kind of some demonstration. So, mass. You adjust your mass. What's the, duration, the, the relationship between mass and uh, exposure? Direct. Direct in every way, right? So, uh, you have 100 mass, and then you change your technique to 200 mass. How much of a change is that? It's a factor of two, right? So it's a factor of two, which is a hundred percent change. It's a hundred percent change. One hundred percent increase means you took that, you doubled it, or you took that, you added another one to it, and that doubled it. So it's either multiplied by two, or you're adding the original value to itself to get to a hundred percent increase. Right? So you, you got 200 mass. So 15% KVP, 15% KVP uh, gives you how much of a change in intensity? 
you increase your KVP by 15%. So you started with 100 KVP, and you increase by 15%, so now you have 115 KV, KVP. What does that equate to at your image receptor? Okay, so 15% rule. That might ring a bell from last semester. You have a technique that you want to use, right? But you want to increase KVP and have the same image receptor exposure, you use a 15% rule. So you increase your KVP by 15%, what do you do with your mass? Doubles. What's that? Doubles. It, the, the intensity doubles. If you yeah. just increase your KVP by 15%, that's what I'm trying to get to, but if you don't want to change in intensity at your image receptor, you increase your KVP by 15%, what do you do with your mass? Decrease by half. Decrease by half. You cut it in half, right? So 15% change in KVP equals a doubling of mass. Does that make sense? If you increase your KVP by 15% and you do nothing else, that's going to give your image receptor exposure the same as if you doubled your mass. 15% change in KVP equals a doubling of the image receptor exposure. It's going to give you the same image receptor exposure as doubling your mass. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Anybody not, not following this? Okay, everybody's good. Okay, then uh, what that means is that for, uh, let's say, a 30%, I need to, should have started this over that way a little bit more. So a 30% change in mass is going to give us how much of a change at the image receptor? If I increase my my mass by 30%, how much of a change at the image receptor if everything is proportional and, and you know, uh, relative and, and proportional in mass? I, I increase by 100% and I got 100% change at the image receptor, right? Uh -huh. I changed by 30%. How much of a change at the image receptor? 30%. 30%, right? 30% equals 30%. Okay, so what is 30% roughly? 30% of something is how much of that something? A third. Roughly a third. Roughly a third. Okay, now let's apply that to KVP. 15% gives us 100%. Right? 15% change in KVP. 15% increase in KVP gives us a 100% increase in intensity at the image receptor, right? So what's a third of 15? Five. Five, right. So would it not make sense that a 5% change in KVP does the same thing as a 30% change in mass? All it is is a third of this or a third of this, okay? So your technical considerations for pathology, if it's an additive pathology, you're gonna go 30 to 50% increase in mass. Okay? So what's half of 15? We already said that, that you know, 50% is half, right? We already said that, that five equals one third of you know, or 15%. So what would half of 15% be? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. All right? Ever seen a seven and a half uh, setting on your machine? So how do you round? You know, you get to 7.5 and what is that? Eight. 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 So plus, if it's an additive condition, it would be plus five to eight KVP. Is that gonna make sense? We tend to stress this, we tend to understress this, you know. All you have to do if you have an additive condition is do one of two things, don't do them both. Increase 30 to 50% in mass, or you can do five to eight KVP. If you have a destructive condition, you would Destruct decrease yeah. by 30 to 50% mass, or decrease your KVP by five to eight KVP. Some things 
uh, you're not really going to consider pathologies. Um, I think Mother Francis still sends students that often. I don't even know if they've got a, a morgue on site, but they used to do post-mortem films sometimes at Mother Francis. You know, the coroner might need an x-ray. All right, so what happens whenever you know a person dies is that the blood settles in the great vessels, right? It's considered pathologic change. You'd change your, your mass by 30 to 50 percent. It's an additive condition. The blood pools in the thoracic cavity and possibly some in the, the abdominal cavity. You've got to adjust your technique. Okay. So Technical considerations, yeah, uh, most of the time it's going to be uh, mass, so 30 to 50 percent change in mass, but you can do KVP, and that would be 5 to 8 percent change in KVP. Okay? Any questions? Are we going to have to do that now on the test? Uh, I don't think so. I think, you know, you just got to pick out the, the correction. Maybe in sophomore year, but... Uh, I want to say there is no math on this test. I want to say. Um, I haven't looked at it since last year, but that's what I want to say. Is that there, what I want you to, to get more than anything else in this, um, uh, this section, this, this time we cover it, is concepts. Okay. We'll get into the uh, little portions of it next year. And there will be math then. A lot of math. All right. So have a good weekend, and I'll see y'all on Monday. Thank you so much. That was the one. Um, I'm about to do it. So the only one for part wasn't bad. Thanks, sir.